All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for another uh, episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions at Jane. And uh, we're gonna be talking about today uh, cannabis, a unique perspective, especially when it comes to water. Now, a few years ago, I was on the Western slope of Colorado doing some training uh, on water conservation to a group and, and somebody from the group raised their hand and said, you know, Rich, love your training. But you know, you're just teaching us to conserve water so we can send that conserved water to California so you guys can grow more marijuana. And, uh, and he was angry about it. I mean, he was, he was kidding, but you could tell that there was something behind that. And that's when I realized, you know, uh, cannabis is a pretty thirsty crop. And uh, we have some people think it's the solution to the opioid crisis or the solution to tax shortfalls and with others still thinking it's not a good thing. So uh, you can tell that there's gonna be a lot of controversy around this subject. And uh, that's why I wanted to have Jim Loria on today to talk about this for uh, many of you know Jim, uh, he's a well-respected uh, writer, uh, podcaster, does a lot of presentations across the country on various different subjects, but a lot on cannabis these days. Uh, you know, Jim is the vice president of sales and marketing for Maisie Injector Company. And uh, we've had Maisie on before too, John Petroso. He did an excellent job on uh, fertigation. So we've got a lot of help and experience on this. Uh, the thing I really appreciate about Jim and uh, we started our careers in talking about water kind of parallel uh, many years ago. But um, for a lot of people, you start talking about water and they start to glaze over very quickly. It's just not that interesting to people. Jim's done a great job at making water interesting. And that's changing uh, people's perspective on water. So uh, Jim, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Rich, I appreciate the intro. And you know, I always joke, yeah, what is a pretty dry subject, right? <laughs> All right, so, see what I mean? So, um, <laughs> so listen, today, you know, your, your presentation is titled Cannabis, A Unique Perspective. What gives you this unique perspective, Jim? Well, I think, you know, I'm a water treatment guy and, uh, you know, I've been following the industry for a while um, and we'll see that that I had started writing about uh, water and cannabis back in 2017. And, and the article I wrote, I used you as a as an expert resource and uh, uh, interesting to me, um, Maisie Injector were involved in all types of agriculture and uh, we just see uh, cannabis as a, a uh, uh, an area that that's going to grow and um, you know, based on a lot of issues, it's a very fluid situation as, and we'll, again, we'll see uh, the states that are legalizing it recreationally, medically, and then at some point it's going to be, um, and most people feel it's going to be uh, um, legalized at the federal level. So um, it's an interesting topic. Uh, there's a lot of ways to look at it, and hopefully people will get that perspective uh, during the presentation. Yeah, definitely interesting. I can't get people to stop talking about it. It comes up at almost every, you know, <laughs> when I'm with a group, uh, this is the subject that always comes up. And if I start talking about it, um, people, you know, gather, you know, they're interested, you can tell in, in a way that they're not so much uh, interested in uh, ETO and ETC when I talk about that for some reason. <laughs> right, 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 right. And so it's a pretty, pretty interesting um, topic. And it's also a flashpoint, like you said, a lot of people have a lot of different um, um, perspectives on it. So this is mine. So this was the uh, article uh, I wrote. Again, uh, you were quoted in it uh, on LinkedIn and I had it on Water Online as well. Um, and it started 2017. So here we are, 2021, going into 2022 and five years. Um, so uh, lots changed. And uh, again, um, I was invited uh, just recently by uh, Tony Sacco of Spartan Environmental to write an article about ozone for water treatment and the cannabis production. And uh, again, it, it allowed me to kind of uh, do the research uh, anew and see how that had changed in the five years from the time I wrote the first article to uh, this time. 
Yeah, it's interesting, Jim, because I remember talking to you about that in 2017 very specifically because I had just returned from a conference in Las Vegas uh, with uh, indoor growers and uh, I was at a booth and uh, talking about irrigation for cannabis. And I was just amazed by the technical expertise that these guys had already, uh, the level in which they wanted to dive into uh, irrigation for cannabis. And uh, I, was, uh, I was thrilled, right, to see it because they were, uh, they were approaching it with a seriousness that uh, I hadn't seen necessarily before. Sure. So uh, I, was, I was very excited about that uh, because I, I could see they were, they were already had a vision of what the challenges could be, and they were trying to figure out some solutions already. Right, right. So based on research, uh, this is pretty much up to date. Um, you can see where cannabis has been legalized, medical and decriminalized, medical, uh, fully illegal, still a few states. But uh, as I said, I mean, things are going to change once it's uh, uh, legalized at the federal level. And, you know, most experts feel that that's going to be the case, right? Yeah, we seem to be accelerating this pace, right, at uh, 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 the states that are legalizing and um, odd, you know, and we really haven't heard much on the federal level now for a while about which way they're going to go. They've been kind of silent on it. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but it's going to happen. I mean, I don't know when it's going to happen, but most people say within the next few years, I think it's pretty obvious. And this kind of shows this is from Grandview Research. Uh, they, they're saying this is what they're projecting. Again, this is going to be based on uh, if it's legalized uh, federally. And look, I mean, at some point, it's, I, I've been ta I talked to a couple of people in Europe, and they're kind of looking at us on how we're going with it. And uh, so as time changes, uh, it's going to be globally, it's going to be uh, increased. And you can see the, the numbers are just striking in terms of both uh, legalizing and people using the flour and also oil for edibles. So it's not only going to be just consumed um, as it had been in the past, but edibles are a huge uh, market that people are looking at, right? Yeah, the other market I see, Jim, coming on, and I've actually seen this at a few restaurants already, is uh, uh, infused drinks, right? Your alcoholic drink infused with uh, uh, some cannabis product, maybe that has some THC in it. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that would change the beverage industry uh, completely if they did that on a federal level. I mean, talk about an opportunity. Yeah, I'm not sure that, I, I think that's going to be problematic though, Richard. I think the, the, the drinks are non-alcoholic. So I think it's going to be infused with THC or CBD. Um, but I don't think they're going to have any, uh, because of the whole, you know, interaction of alcohol and THC, I, I don't see that happening for some period of time where they're going to have actual alcohol infused with THC. So yeah. just, just yeah, it, right. There's a lot of chemicals going on. There, right? <laughs> don't yeah. They play well together. Exactly. And the interaction is going to be a problem. And then, you know, then you've got the Bureau of Alcohol and Firearms, you know, they're, they're tobacco, alcohol, and firearms. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, you know, as cannabis is coming out of the shadows, as I, as I write here, cannabis currently now is a top value crop in California. 60 to 70% of all the marijuana sold in the United States comes from California. And we'll talk about those numbers. You and I had a discussion about that um, the other day. 11 to $17 billion per year is the value of the California cannabis crop. And it's more than double the next uh, ranked commodity, which is milk and cheese. So, I mean, it's a huge commodity. And I think what we were talking about is that um, somebody, somebody wrote uh, in, in a recent article that um, they figured there's about 13 million pounds of marijuana produced in California, but only 2.5 million of those are consumed in California. So that means that almost 10 million pounds a year are exported outside of California, which means it's illegal because you can't export it. So uh, when, when it's federally re uh, decriminalized, when it's uh, legalized, uh, that's gonna change the whole dynamic of how things are, uh, people are gonna look at it. 
Yeah, it's interesting too, Jim, uh, because I think when I when I hear that, I also think that we're exporting our water that way, right? It's going right out of the state. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, and and right now, um, most of the people that are are really looking at those illegal farms are really the fish and game, the California fish and game, because. Um, that's exactly right. I mean, that water and, and they're using the illegal marijuana farms are using water from streams and lakes. They're putting pressure on, on fish and, and other wildlife. They're using illegal uh, pesticides, rodenticides, and uh, the, 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 the food chain is being affected. So, you know, higher level animals are dying because they're consuming smaller rodents that so there's a lot of issues around it. And once, once it becomes legalized, <laughs> then it won't be the fish and game people going after things. It'll be the IRS. And because they'll be losing that revenue, right? So <laughs> it'll be a different dynamic. Yeah, definitely. So, hey, and I just want to remind everybody, our Q&A and our chat are both open uh, this afternoon. So if you've got some questions you'd like to uh, pose to Jim, uh, put them in there and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask them uh, when it's appropriate. So again, this is a little bit about uh, a few articles I found about the, the legal cannabis farms versus the illegal cannabis farms. And uh, the legal cannabis farms feel that, that they're currently at a, at a disadvantage because they're playing by the rules and uh, uh, they can't use those pesticides. They can't use um, uh, water that's, that's uh, not, not legal. And uh, if, if you, one of the things I found out during my first research uh, five years ago is that 50% of the land that is in California is owned by the federal government. So a lot of these illegal farms are actually operating on federal land. And uh, so, so once it gets regulated, um, I think there's, again, it's gonna be chain, it's gonna be a change in California on how things are grown. Jim, if I, it's tough enough to grow anything, right? Whether it be uh, flowers or food, it's tough and it's risky. So why in the world would I wanna invest that much money, that much energy and that much effort into something I could get arrested for growing? Well, I mean, it's because of money. <laughs> it's a very valuable crop, right? And we'll talk about that a little further. I mean, you compare it to any other crop. I mean. Cannabis is sold by the gram, right? Yeah. And compared to, you know, any other, any other kind of crop by the pound, by the ton, it's, it, that's why people take the risk, right? Yeah. So, so, right. I get that. So why wouldn't I just want to be legal? Why wouldn't I just go ahead and get licensed and, and do it that way? And then I don't have to look over my shoulder. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody's always uh, trying to skirt the system and uh, they, they, they don't want to be monitored. And, and that's the other thing, Richard. I mean, a lot of these growers have been doing this for years illegally, and they've been getting away with it. And so they're thinking, well, I've done it for years, and I've been getting away with it. Um, I'm just going to keep doing it the way I've been doing it and, and, not, and not giving my share to the state, right? So right. That's, that's, that's it. So here's a little, few more um, examples of... Uh, you know, stolen water by illegal uh, marijuana grows. So, um, but it, it, it is a big issue. It's really a big issue. Yeah, I guess the thing that uh, it concerns me, uh, Jim, is do we have any idea about how much water they're using if they're taking it illegally? Yeah, well, it's tough. I mean, we, we don't. And, and the problem, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, is the, the problem is that there's not much research being done because it is an illegal crop, right? And so you, you don't have the FDA and EPA and any federal or governmental agencies really doing research. And then the academic institutions, the universities, they don't want to do any research on it because it could affect their uh, federal funding. So um, there's a real lacking of, uh, of, of information about you know, what exactly is, how much water is, being used per per uh, crop or you know per per pound of marijuana produced, so it's 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 a it's a real missing. Yeah, that's a great point. I know you know I'm associated with Master Gardeners in California, and uh, 
because we're part of the UC program. We're, uh, this is something we just don't talk about. We don't provide information on and and um, it's uh, un unfortunate, right? Because this is uh, such a growing area and, and people just need to know the proper practices. Yeah, I showed before the, 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 uh, the, the volume that's moving, right? It's the number one crop in California, a biologic stand. So, so this is some information from uh, Colorado. And again, we talked about the value, right? So a return of 22 cents to $6.67. Again, the wide range because of the lack of, uh, of research. And then, you know, if you look at uh, on used in potatoes, it's two to three cents. So uh, where are you going to put your money? Where are you going to put your water? It's there. And the, and the other takeaway from this, uh, from this slide is that while the stoners in Colorado will have all the marijuana they can possibly want, they might not have the potato chips when they get a case of the munchies. So. <laughs> So it's interesting. I heard from uh, somebody at the uh, um, MJ Business Con this week, and it was a uh, it was a grower of lettuce, and he he was saying that you know it's going to get this this number is going to come down, right? The, the the amount of money the growers are making is going to come down as more people get into it. He was like, I've been I've been involved in ag doing this professionally for years. Uh, when it comes down to actually being profitable and uh, knowing how to do it. I've got a much higher chance, a higher probability of still being here in three or four years than uh, than somebody who just learned it a few years ago. Right, right. So the other place that uh, I've been interested in, and, and, and Maisie's very involved in the uh, wine industry, and uh, uh, there's a lot of competition. I was just reading an article today in one of the wine magazines about this whole connection between uh, wine and what they call, they just had a symposium, and this woman, Terry Wheatley, president of Vintage Wine Estates, and she's also the chairwoman of the board for Canacraft, she uh, addressed the intersection of the wine and cannabis industries. And here's what she predicted, 420 million by the end of 2021 for cannabis sales, 1 billion by 2025, and 100 billion by 2030, which is just staggering numbers, right? And the, the thing about the wine and weed is, they're competing for land, they're competing for water, and they're, they're kind of abutting each other. And there's a couple of issues there. Um, you know, wine is, is a kind of a tourist uh, destination. And you go to a vineyard, you don't really want to be smelling that objectionable odor of uh, that pungent smell of marijuana next door. And also they're concerned about, and this is not only for wine, but for other crops, the drift of the fertilizers and the, you know some fertilizers and 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 pesticides and things that can be used on tomatoes and 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 strawberries are illegal to use on cannabis and vice versa. So it's a it's a big it's it's a big issue. The objectionable odor, the drift of different uh, 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 components that you use to grow. So um, it's people are talking a lot about this. Yeah, so Jim, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. And sure. uh, the first one is, I mean, this is staggering, this 100 billion by 2030. Right. Um, who is consuming all this? <laughs> uh, the demographics, I mean, you got a bunch of old hippies, right? right? <laughs> From the 60s, friends of mine. And, and then you've got a bunch of uh, younger people that uh, are consuming it. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, I, I, th I think the stigma attached to it is, is less. Um, also, they're finding some benefits for post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, you know, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, there's a lot of reasons why it's growing. I mean, and, and the demographics are huge from, like I said, people our age to younger generations. Um, it's, it's, it's less stigma, right? Yeah. But you, you mentioned that twice, right? That came up stigma, stigma, right? And that's, right. that's my challenge with it. Right. Um, you know, but if I think about it, should, should I be taking an opioid or, or cannabis? I mean, that's pretty clear for me what that decision would be if I was ever uh, offered that. Um, but, um, when, when, you know, do you see it losing its stigma anytime soon? Well, if it's if it's uh, 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 
decriminalized or legalized uh, by the federal government. One of the big problems now is for, for the people, and, and that's another issue we, we talked about, you know, for, for why people um, don't want to do it legally, um, you, can't, you can't use your banking system uh, to, to uh, uh, get loans, to uh, uh, even to, to, uh, to, to put your money in, right? You, it's a, it's a federally uh, illegal, it's a, it's a class one narcotic with same level as heroin. Yeah. I mean, so, so that's the other reason why people are having a hard time doing it legally, because you got to work around having a bunch of cash around, paying your employees in cash, carrying cash around. So it's, it's, it's a problem. So I think that's, that's going to be the big issue. When it gets legalized on a federal level, that's going to change everything. Yeah, I think uh, it was a few, few years ago, I, I knew a guy who was uh, who had grown a lot and wasn't growing anymore. And I said, you know, you could be making a lot more money as a grower than what you're doing today. Why don't you grow? And he said, well, because, you know, I've got a daughter in high school and I don't want us people saying, hey, there goes Sally. Her dad's the marijuana grower. Right. He was concerned about that. Where is would have been, hey, there goes Sally's dad, the pharmaceutical rep. No right. problem. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So one of the things that I see, and uh, you know, talking about trends, I really see it having to move indoors, um, and ultimately that's where I think it's going to be grown, as, as well as other crops. You know, ultimately I think because of the whole issues around uh, uh, water conservation, I, I really feel that any crop that can be grown indoors will be. And so, and cannabis leads to leads the charge because of the value of the crops. Um, you can see this is some information from AgriList. You know, the indoor cannabis yield one hundred and twelve dollars a square foot. Indoor greens, uh, people like Plenty and Bowery Farming, they're, they're growing uh, arugula. I, 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 you know, after we finish this uh, uh, this webinar, I'm going to go have a sandwich. I'm going to put arugula on my salad uh, on my sandwich, and it grew about, uh, you know, a couple of miles from my house here in San Francisco. So, you know, and in strawberries, the, the work people are doing around that and tomatoes. So uh, I really feel that uh, there's going to be most of the, and, and then we talked about the odor, right? As far as cannabis, um, you can control that odor a lot more. You can control the drift of nutrients. You can manage the water better. So there's a lot of reasons why I, I really believe cannabis is going to uh, move indoors. Yeah. Hey, Jim, we had a comment come into that I, I just have to have to make, right? Because it is so good. It, I think it's spot on. Yeah. And somebody mentioned that, um, you know, in the Sally example, uh, you know, there goes Sally's, that uh, Sally's friends would probably think that was cool. And uh, <laughs> I think that's a really good point. I think uh, a lot absolutely. of this is generational. I think it makes uh, that uh, point. That, but but yeah. Sally's friends' parents might not think that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Very generational, yeah, and you can yeah. see that turning. Yeah, and thank then, you for the for the good point. Yeah, and and like all consumables, uh, cannabis will eventually be required to meet good manufacturing practices. I mean, that's going to be important. If 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 it's legalized on a federal level, the FDA is going to be involved. Uh, you know, on edibles and you know the it, it, it's it's like I said, it's going to be a game changer, and things are going to change dramatically. And then we talked about this, you know, research limited due to academic institutions avoiding federal, you know, federal regulated substance. They don't want to lose their funding. Regulatory framework, FDA, the EPA is non existent now. So there's, there's a lot of issues. So, really, now, and, and that's what, another reason why I got involved in it, is they're looking to industry for inspiration on tools and applications. So, really, it's, and, and this is why what you're doing here, Richard, is a really good service because. Um, there is a lack of knowledge and, uh, you know, the more people get acclimated to it and we understand it, the, the better it is for all of us, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is a wave of momentum. Nobody's going to stop. Exactly. And so we, right, as professionals have to figure out how to help the industry grow, uh, help the industry uh, conserve water and, uh, and, and help educate the best we can. Yeah, exactly right. 
So a little bit about uh, ozone, and, and, and because I'm involved very much in the ozone industry, it's, a, it's an area that uh, Maisie really plays in. Uh, I'm on the uh, Executive Operating Committee of the International Ozone Association. Um, I really saw this as an opportunity in the water treatment field and, and also for other applications in the cannabis market. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ozone. Um, I know you and I talked about this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, you, you thought it'd be really interesting to the audience. So just yeah, and I, I just got to say, Jim, there's probably a few hundred people right now who really didn't even know that there was an ozone association that existed. So <laughs> yeah. what, uh, what do you all do? Yeah, so uh, just a little bit about ozone, um, and, and I'll, I'll get into the uh, association a little bit. Um, ozone was discovered by uh, uh, this, this uh, German gentleman, uh, Christian Friedrich Schoenbein. Um, in 1839, he was playing around and he, he created ozone. And uh, actually, ozone is, uh, is uh, three oxygen molecules linked together. Oxygen typically, uh, I'm sorry, three oxygen atoms linked together. Oxygen molecule is two typically. And he broke apart the oxygen molecule and hooked up those three together. And uh, it gave off a smell, um, a pungent smell. And if you ever around the lightning strike, um, when, when you're, you'll smell that little bit of uh, uh, strong odor in the air, or when it, there's an electric motor arcing, you'll smell that strong pungent smell. That's ozone. And um, it, it's, uh, it, it's got a lot of uh, good properties to it. Um, it's used in a lot of applications uh, in water reuse, bottled water. It's a very strong oxidant, a very strong disinfectant. Um, it's used in aquaculture, uh, in uh, uh, cleaning place in breweries and wineries. It's used in some healthcare settings, laundries, in medicine and dentistry, and industrial and mining, air handling, cooling towers. So there's a, a large application and mostly, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about how, how it's formed. I, I talked a little bit about basically from an electrical discharge, similar to an electrical storm. And an ozone generator, it takes in oxygen. It breaks apart the oxygen molecule into single uh, oxygens, uh, atoms, and then it reconnects. And, and ozone generators, they, the gas must be dry, it must be particle free, and it must be cooled. And so it's pretty, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty involved process to make ozone. And, and there's a couple of good things about it. And there's a couple of detrimental things about it that I'll go into. Yeah, because one thing I'm thinking about, right, is um, uh, chlorine's a disinfectant, but I don't really want it around my plants. Right. Ozone's a disinfectant, but it helps our plants. Yeah, so, so here's a little, uh, here's the oxidation potentials. So it's a very strong oxidant. You can see, you know, after, after fluorine, so much stronger than uh, chlorine and, and uh, some of the other hydrogen peroxide, iodine. The good thing about ozone is that it breaks down into oxygen which is good for your plants, right? Um, so, so that's good. The, the one problem with ozone is that it's very short lived. It has a very short uh, uh, life and it only sticks around for like 15 minutes. So while it is a strong oxidant and a strong disinfectant, the reason we use chlorine for our drinking water is we want it to stick around right till it gets to your house. So it sticks around in the distribution system. So if there's any, so you put it in at the drinking water treatment plant, and if there's any breaks in a line, which we talked about early on in our, uh, when we were you know, getting ready for the presentation, um, if there's a break in the line and any dirt, uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, any of that stuff gets into the, in, into the, the broken line, the chlorine's there, to, to take care of the viruses, bacteria, and so on. But ozone wouldn't be. So, so one of the issues is you can't store ozone, so you have to produce it on site, right? And, and it can't be held in a storage tank or anything like that. So Jim, how do I produce it on site? Using an ozone generator. And okay. uh, so I showed a little bit about that. Let me go back a little bit here. Let me, let me go back to... Go back here. 
Yeah, so, so basically you're pulling in some oxygen. It could either be liquid oxygen and they've got this uh, dielectric, uh, glass ceramic dielectric on the bottom there. You can see it on the bottom right. Pull it in, break, out, uh, break the uh, ozone molecule into a single oxygen molecule that recombines with some of the oxygen and that produces ozone. So uh, uh, very, very um, sensitive and uh, you really have to know what you're doing uh, and a lot of these are designed uh, specifically for different applications. Some for drinking water, big systems, and some smaller ones, which I'll get into for uh, uh, some of the small applications, being mostly uh, so cannabis and uh, um, some of the agricultural applications. Right. Go back to the last one now. Right here. So in um, cannabis, Ozone is used in a number of applications. So for uh, treating fertigation and irrigation water, um, any bacteria that's coming in, viruses, things that you'd want to, you, you wouldn't want to get these pathogens to the root zone. Uh, treatment of wastewater as you're recycling, you, you use a ozone. Uh, sanitation, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the applications where you, between grows, you're gonna be spraying down surfaces. It's a very good disinfectant sanitizer. Um, one of the big applications that I didn't mention, almost every single hot tub or spa has an ozone, small ozone generator and small, uh, and, and, and a Maisie Venturi to pull in that ozone to uh, treat the water. Because what it does is it breaks down biofilm and I'll get more into that. And then from the, Air emission side, like we talked about the objectionable odors, it does a good job breaking down those odors and then actually use this disinfection on the finished product. So I'll, I'll go into to these each in turn. So it goes without saying that water is a vital for the crop growth, especially in indoor systems. And as the water delivers nutrients and other input puts, um, every, managing every drop of water is critical. And so you're using the ozone to basically break up any biofilm. And biofilm is a problem. So let me go to the next slide here. Um, you can grow it, cannabis with or without soil and hydroponic systems. So um, the, the nutrient-rich fertigation water, it's a breeding ground for plant pathogens. pathogens. And biofilm, one of the things you use ozone for, as I mentioned, for the spa industry, um, <clears throat> The, the, you have chlorine in your spa, but the chlorine has to be able to get to those pathogens in order to do its work. And ozone does a good job of breaking down the biofilm to actually get the treatment to those pathogens. And it works the same way. And biofilm, it not only can harbor pathogens, but it also plugs fil filters and emitters, right? And then, you know, greenhouse and nursery operations there, they're particularly susceptible to biofilm problems. And then, you know, like I said, ozone can be used to prevent the biofilm, remove plant pathogens. And as it breaks down to add oxygen to the water, which is another reason it's, it's a good, uh, um, good for application in the, in the uh, cannabis market. Right. So I'm sold. I need a um, <clears throat> ozone generator, right, for my uh, my indoor grow. Right. Is it expensive? Um, it's 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 I wouldn't say it's expensive. It's, uh, you know, but it is complex. Right. So you want to get somebody that knows what they're doing. And I, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it's it's not that expensive, but it, it's it's more expensive than, you know, uh, just uh, any other kind of application you you would you would have, and all depends on the size of your operation, obviously. Yeah, well, and I imagine the expense of not having one could uh, could be catastrophic, right? Right, right, and, and and you know how expensive can it be? Like I said, every spa and hot tub has a small one on it, um, and you'd probably need a, a bigger one than you would have on your hot tub. But on the other hand, you wouldn't need one that, that would be used in a drinking water plant. So it's all relative, right? Right. So waste, for wastewater treatment, they haven't been defined the challenges. So for growers, water that's not recycled and has to be discharged, ozone can treat the, this effluent. Um, and it does a good job, again, to, to break down, to disinfect any of that. And then for processes, 
um, with the oils and solvents in the wastewater, ozone-based uh, AOP, which means uh, uh, the, the uh, advanced oxidation process, where you would combine ozone with some other treatment uh, um, uh, technology, either uh, UV light or hydrogen peroxide. The combination produces hydroxyl radicals, which are very effective in breaking down any of these oils and solvents in wastewater. So it's a combination, uh, kind of a belt and suspenders approach that is used in a lot of uh, uh, wastewater applications. So um, that, that's, that's the area where wastewater would be. And then also for sanitation now, so here's a cart and, and I'm not sure how much this cart would be, but it's not that expensive. Um, this is our, from our friends at Clearwater Tech. They produce this small, uh, uh, ozone for sanitation. And the good thing about uh, ozone is it's, it's very soluble in cold water. So you don't need the, the um, hot water for sanitizing surfaces. And it's pretty simple and flexible. You can have one of these carts to move around your facility. You can have a wall mounted uh, system. Um, and uh, uh, between grows, you really want to spray down all the all the the, the sanit uh, all, all the surfaces that would be in a in a facility, and then um, we talked about the problem with objectionable odors. So in the cannabis growing market um, or in the cannabis processing, you can put the uh, an ozone uh, in the gas phase uh, in your um, uh, in your HVA system. So as you're pulling out the air, the ozone is actually um, breaking down the uh, terpenes that are released, breaking down the odors so that the exhaust isn't going to be going out to the neighborhood uh, and uh, disturbing the neighbors uh, because of, hey, what's that smell that we're, we're, we're uh, smelling downstream, right? Yeah, this seems to be one of the big issues, right, is uh, being a good neighbor and having those complaints, and those complaints can be very uh, vocal and valid. Uh, so if you can, if, if ozone's going to help with that, that that's, that's really a great thing. Right, 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 right. Especially as indoor grows and, you know, in urban environments, um, you know, there could be a school downwind and, you know, you certainly don't want that happening. There could be other you know, processing facilities, food, plants, restaurants, whatever. So um, it's, it's, it is a big issue and it's, it, ozone is a good uh, solution. And then the final one is it can be used to safely clean cannabis flowers um, with, uh, you know, that mold mildew builds up. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that um, you don't have that uh, affecting the quality. Now, you have to be careful because if you over dose with ozone, it'll break down some of the THC, some of the CBDs. So you really want an expert in being able to, you know, design the system for the size of the room you have for the amount of product you're moving through. So um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, you want it, you want some experts that, that are doing this. And so one of my final slides, I wanted to show again, my friends from Oxidation Technologies, they're, they're experts in this. And you know, I promote them because uh, uh, you can see there's a Venturi injector, which uh, at the bottom left there, going in, in uh, injecting the ozone. Um, it's amazing. They use all Maisie injectors. So uh, this, this kind of shows all the different aspects of it, for, for everything from the irrigation water, the fertigation water, to the um, use of it for uh, the uh, HVA system, uh, for sanitation, for uh, wastewater treatment. Um, not every facility will use ozone for all the applications, but this kind of shows you what kind of design would be for uh, each individual one. And they even, they even have an, one where they show an AOP system at the very bottom to the right with the UV. Well, that's actually a UV ozone destructor. So one of the things about ozone for the water, you wanna make sure that you don't send ozone downstream to mix in with your fertilizers because ozone is a very strong oxidant. It break down the, the, the fertilizer. So you want the ozone to do its job um, in sanitizing and disinfecting, but 
you don't want it to hang around so it breaks down organics and creates problems downstream. So um, that's one reason they have that UV ozone destruct unit. Yeah, I can see why you say you want to bring in an expert. I'm looking at this diagram and I'm like, wow, it's, <laughs> you know, it's complicated, which is good, right? I mean, there's lots of checks and balances here right. and you want to keep everything within a certain, um, uh, certain factor. Right. Uh, Right. And you said that, you know, the cost, obviously, this is much more extensive than that ozone card I showed previous. Um, I'm not sure how much a card would cost. It's not that expensive. But, you know, if you're going to do a full blown system, it's going to be more expensive than just the uh, just the, the card. Right. Right. And if I'm dealing with a uh, multi million dollar crop a couple times a year, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to want the best on there. Correct. Correct. So with that, I'll take any questions. I mean, we've had some along the way. Uh, any other uh, comments, questions, happy to answer. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, always like to engage there. Or if you want to contact me directly, uh, jloria at maisy.net is my email address. Yeah, and that's really nice and generous, uh, Jim, of you to offer that. I hope our uh, viewers take advantage of that. You know, one of the questions that came up that we didn't get a chance to, to answer yet, and that is, you know, this is such a new field, a new industry, uh, and what I mean by new uh, indoor cannabis growing, um, where do you get some of your knowledge? Where can people find additional knowledge on these subjects? And that isn't just a plug for the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I mean, other places. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I'm always on the lookout for it. And so, um, you know, just LinkedIn is a good one. I mean, I, I've engaged with a lot of people on LinkedIn. Uh, Water Online has been doing some work on around this. Uh, they published a, a really good article a couple of months ago that I read that I've engaged with uh, uh, some, some people. So um the, the the newspaper uh i mean it's a big topic right so people are interested in where it's going and i just kind of try and connect the dots between water and 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 cannabis and and also uh indoor growing i mean that's a greenhouses and and indoor farms are going to be a a big growing area not just for cannabis but uh, as i said uh, leafy greens uh, strawberries tomatoes i really feel that anything that can be grown indoors uh, should be and save the water for crops that can't be grown indoors, like uh, pistachios, almonds, uh, wine grapes, things like that. And and so that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Now I do. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, we had another question come in, and it has to do with the dosing rate. Uh, most vendors seem to uh, express doses in terms of grams, but. That's hard for most uh, people to, you know, comprehend or know. So um, how do you determine an, uh, the dosage needed for any given irrigation system? Yeah, again, the experts are going to. So so just for for I was at a at the conference at WEFTEC. So so typically for drinking water, it's one to three uh, uh, grams, uh, mill, uh, milligrams per liter. And, and for wastewater, it's three to five milligrams per liter of ozone. And, uh, and, and one of the things I didn't talk about is you have to really, it's a, it's a safety concern too, because ozone, it, because it's a strong oxidant, it can be harmful to people's lungs. So you got to make sure that it's captured and it's controlled because it, at, at higher levels, it can, it can cause real problems and even death. And so, you know, one of the things you talked about when, when I started with the International Ozone Association, we're really about being responsible in its use. And so we put together a safety training video on ozone and oxygen. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, I can get you a link to that because uh, we, we want to make sure people don't just use ozone. I mean, you can see the benefits, but you know, like any, any type of uh, chemical or uh, uh, component like uh, that, that's going to be used uh, for uh, uh, as a strong oxidant, you got to be careful because it can cause serious harm. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's something that we we take very seriously, and we want to make sure people use uh, ozone in a very safe uh, manner. Uh, great points. Now, Jim, you also have a podcast you do too, right? Uh, yeah. And so, what's the name of that podcast? And you guys ever talk about uh, cannabis on there? Yeah. So, so uh, the podcast with my uh, co-host Adam Tank. It's called "What Are We Talking About." 
and we got you coming up in, in a couple of weeks uh, as a guest. And I don't know, did we talk about cannabis uh, when we had you on? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't think we did, but uh, think we, we could did. have. Yeah, we could have. So, you know, one of the good things about the, uh, about the podcast is it, it's sponsored by Water Online. And the Water Online audience is mostly uh, focused on drinking water, wastewater, municipal and industrial applications, and not as much about agricultural applications. And so one of the things that I, uh, I talked to about my co-host was I really wanted people to, front in that community, I wanted some crossover. So we had you on, we had my friend Dan Keppen from the Family Farm Alliance. We had a good friend, John Fawner, formerly with uh, the IA and now with Netafim. Um, and, and so we, we've got some really good crossover on uh, some of the uh, agricultural applications of water that, uh, you know, we're sharing water, right? So it's always important to understand uh, we're competing with urban applications, with uh, industrial applications. So, so it's all connected. So we, we really wanted to have people who understood that. And we, it, it, your interview was great. And, and we'll really promote that when, uh, when it's uh, gonna be posted, which like I said, in a couple of weeks, we'll have, you, you know, we'll have it posted on Water Online and, and all our other podcast uh, partners, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, all those. So it was yeah. great. Yeah, th thanks for having me on again. And uh, yeah, you and Adam Tank are doing a great job on that. Uh, I really enjoy all the episodes. So thank you. Yeah, and I want to say thank you to all our uh, visitors today, uh, our viewers. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks to Jim for being so generous with his time and his uh, contact information here. Uh, that's really a nice offer to contact him. Uh, we're going to be back uh, next week. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the 4G and 5G networks and irrigation uh, on Wednesday. should be very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of change right now happening with the 3G sunset. Uh, and also remember, all of our irrigation trainings are at uh, janesusa.com forward slash trainings. And wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Um, Jim, thanks a lot. Uh, we My really pleasure. appreciate you being Thank on you here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. And we will see you all next week. Thanks. Uh -huh.